Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm Mark Zitter, chair of the Zetima Project, a member of the club's board of governors and your moderator for today's program on COVID-19 vaccines and returning to normalcy. Please visit us regularly at commonwealthclub.org to hear uh, all about all of our COVID-19 programs and other topics as well. You know, we've done more than 50 programs this year related to the pandemic. I hosted the very first one on March 18th of this year when I mentioned that there were at that point about 7,500 cases of COVID-19 in the U.S. and about 100 deaths. Things certainly have changed a lot since then. The Commonwealth Club has been offering its, un, its outstanding programming virtually ever since the pandemic made public gatherings unwise. And these restrictions have significantly impacted the club, as you can imagine. But we continue to keep you informed on the pandemic and other critical issues. Please consider a donation to the club so we can continue our 117-year-old tradition during this challenging time. Uh, I also invite you to become a member to have priority access to all of the great programs coming in 2021. To donate, please text the word donate to 415-329-4231. That's 415-329-4231 or visit the club's website at commonwealthclub.org. Okay, let's get to the coronavirus. The story is a split screen. On the one hand, we have exceeded 17 million cases of COVID-19 in America and lost more than 300,000 American lives. COVID-19 is now the leading cause of death in America. And last week, CDC Director Robert Redfield warned that for the next 60 to 90 days, we'll see more deaths from COVID-19 every day than we suffered during the September 11th attacks or during the bombing of Pearl Harbor. But I think what brings the pandemic home to most of us are our personal experiences. As I found out myself last week, uh, two weeks ago, when a cousin of mine died from COVID. That was more powerful than any abstract statistic. So that's one side of the split screen, and it's a horrendous story. On the other screen, the news about a vaccine for the coronavirus is fantastic. For this novel disease that we had never heard of a year ago, We've created not one, but multiple safe and effective vaccines in an effort that many call the greatest scientific achievement in human history. The vaccine produced by Pfizer and BioNTech just got the green light from the FDA last Friday. It was shipped this weekend. And as I'm sure most of you have heard, uh, just yesterday, it, the first vaccine was administered to healthcare professionals in the United States. So we have these two powerful vectors colliding right now a burgeoning disease and a growing armament of vaccines to slow and combat the disease. So the questions are, how fast can we get a vaccine into enough arms of Americans to slow and stop the disease? Who will get it first? Who will have to wait the longest? And who may not take it at all? How long will it take to get our lives back to normal and what will normal look like compared to what it was before the pandemic? Well, as moderator, I get to ask the hard questions, but don't have to answer them. Fortunately, we have two terrific experts, both Commonwealth Club veterans, to help answer these and other questions. And I'll introduce them to you right now. Dr. Robert Wachter is professor and chair of the Department of Medicine at the University of California of San Francisco, where he is the Holly Smith Distinguished Professor in Science and Medicine and the Benioff Endowed Chair in Hospital Medicine. He is the author of 250 articles and six books and writes often for the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and many other publications. In 2015, Modern Healthcare Magazine ranked him as the most influential physician executive in the country. But for all these accolades, the real reason that Bob is here is because when the pandemic first started, Bob just began, began tweeting about what he was seeing at UCSF. His perspective as both a practicing physician and a hospital executive caught on. And since then, his tweets on COVID-19 have been viewed over 50 million times by more than 250,000 followers. Welcome, Bob. Our other guest is Ken Kelly, a veteran biotech and vaccine executive currently working as a strategic advisor to and co-founder of several companies focused on infectious diseases including the treatment and prevention of COVID-19. From 2016 through 2018, Ken was a White House Presidential Executive Fellow 
and an advisor on pandemic preparedness to the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, with whose director, Anthony Fauci, he's still regularly in touch, and the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, or BARDA, and the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA. So Ken brings both vaccine business and policy expertise to us today. So Bob and Ken, welcome back to the Commonwealth Club. I have some questions for you, of course, and uh, the audience also is invited to ask questions in the chat, and I will try to include as many as I possibly can. I'm sure we'll have more than we can handle, but we'll get to all the most important ones. So Bob, I wanna start with you. Uh, I just mentioned the headlines of how bad the pandemic is on a national level. What are you seeing right now at UCSF? Uh, we are, uh, first of all, thanks for having me and us. Um, we are seeing a surge unlike any that we have seen in the pandemic. Uh, as you know, San Francisco has had a remarkably benign experience so far. Um, we had we stomped on the curve in March and April. We saw a bit of a surge in June and turned it around very quickly. Uh, this time it's not turning around. It's going in the wrong direction and, 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 and at a pretty fast trajectory. So a month ago at UCSF, we had 10 COVID patients and two or three on ventilators. Uh, today we have 50 uh, and about 10 or 12 on ventilators. So about five times the volume we had uh, in the beginning. That doesn't stress the system in a major way. It's obviously challenging to take care of the patients, but it hasn't caused us to, uh, it's a 600 bed hospital. We have 70 ICU beds. So there's still plenty of room, but things are going in the wrong direction. And what's different about this uh, from prior surges is despite the governor and the uh, region's uh, stay at home orders uh, that were issued a couple of weeks ago, it doesn't seem like things are turning around. And I think that's probably Thanksgiving effect on top of people uh, people going out and, and not following the rules. So going in the wrong direction and uh, and we'll see. We're hoping it will turn around soon. Well, I want to ask you to push a little more on that. What do you expect the next several months to look like both in the Bay Area and across the country? Well, I, I, this may now be, uh, I may be locked into sort of our performance so far and, and be a little bit more uh, hopeful than realistic. I really do think that the rates in the Bay Area of, of mask wearing and following the rules and, and, uh, and paying attention to the public health guidelines have been so good that I do expect that it will plateau and will begin turning around. The question is what the toll will be before that. And the other question will be the Christmas holidays. Because normally, if you look at what happened in June, it was about six weeks before the beginning of the surge, then the plateau and things began to turn around. We're now at six weeks into the surge. So normally we would be plateauing and turning around. It's not happening yet. And my worry is that just at about the time that it might start happening, and that the new regulations, people being more careful, uh, started to kick in, Christmas will hit and we'll start seeing another surge. So I'm a little worried that we are going to continue to see a growth in cases and hospitalizations until uh, until January. And of course, as we'll get to, the vaccines are incredibly hopeful and thrilling, but won't have a meaningful effect on the overall shape of the curve for, uh, for a couple of months. Well, we'll talk more about that. In fact, Ken, let me turn to you. Hope you have a little bit of, uh, at least a little bit of good news for us. I mentioned uh, that uh, Pfizer and BioNTech is just beginning distribution of its vaccine as of yesterday. But give us the bigger picture. How many vaccines are likely to be, be approved over the next month or two? And how quickly do you think they can be rolled out to most of the population? Yeah. So as we all know, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine uh, started rolling out yesterday, as you said, and approved, not approved, authorized under emergency use authorization last Friday. The briefing package to the FDA from Moderna just came out this morning. Uh, I skimmed through it. And the VRPAC, Vaccines and Related Biologics Advisory Committee, will be meeting again this Thursday, again, live on the web for those that want to watch it. And I think I and others anticipate that Moderna's vaccine will also get emergency use authorization this coming Friday. And then shipments on that, again, will begin next week. So the critical question is how many millions of doses will get distributed through, <laughs> honestly, through FedEx and UPS to the natural distribution centers and hospital settings and clinics and so forth, and your, eventually your CVS and Walgreens. Uh, and that is the critical question. In the press and in conversations, I've seen a variety of numbers. Uh, the initial numbers were going to have $100 million by the end, uh, sorry, 100 million doses by the end of the year, which uh, is a great start. But now, most recently, that's been marked down to $40 million. In the case of Pfizer, uh, they have 7 million doses, but General Perna has said he's going to hold 
half of that in reserve as the second dose of a two-dose regimen. So only 2.9 million doses are being shipped uh, really this month. Um, in addition, each company uh, publicly has said that they were going to sell uh, to the government 100 million doses in the first half of next year. And this morning's press, Moderna upped that by another 100 million. So you're looking at enough vaccinations for, say, 150 million Americans through a full course by next June in the first and second quarter of next year. If all of production goes well and all of transportation and distribution and vaccination programs go well. And there's a lot of ifs in there, which we can talk about and get into the details as well. And last time you were here, you said there were like 100 vaccines in development or something like that. So what about all the rest of them? Yeah, so uh, yes, last time we got together in the Commonwealth Club, we talked about the, the, uh, the vaccine marathon. And yes, there were 150 entrants and there still are, <laughs> believe it or not. Others have finished the race in different countries. Uh, China has three uh, approved, approved vaccines. Uh, Russia has one. Those are being distributed in those countries and elsewhere. Uh, in our race, in Operation Warp Speed, uh, and these are the professional runners, as we call them, because they're backed by the federal government to, to billions of dollars. Coming behind these two, uh, you will have uh, Johnson & Johnson or Janssen, uh, AstraZeneca, and then coming behind that, you'll have Novavax and GSK Sanofi. Uh, and each of those next pairs of vaccines are a different technology from this mRNA technology, which are the first two that are out the gate. And we could talk about those nuances uh, if they're important. And behind that, you still have others, uh, another dozen, and two dozen that are coming. The CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovations, just put out a call for new proposals for vaccines last week. And the point of that is that, you, let's put this in context, Operation Warp Speed was all about speed. What's the fastest we can get a vaccine? And we've done it in less than one year, which is a stunning scientific achievement, as Mark pointed out at the very beginning. But we didn't, Operation Warp Speed didn't target the ideal target product profile, what industry would call a TPP. For example, could a vaccine be single dose? Could it be much longer duration? Could it be very inexpensive? Could it be stored at room temperature? Could it be delivered without a needle or syringe, perhaps orally or intranasally? And so that's why there's these other vaccines, let's call them second generation vaccines, because they sure, surely will be in the next pack in late 2021. They're still worthy of development and potentially very impactful for the rest of the world. Maybe not the United States, because hopefully we'll be vaccinated uh, next year, but we'll come back to that if you like. But I guess the real question for the shorter term is, are there any other vaccines likely to have an impact on us in the next six or nine months? Yeah. So it is likely that the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines will pass from emergency use authorization to formal approval in the April-May timeframe of next year. They need to collect six months of safety data. So far we have two. And then they'll file and probably I predict each will rapidly be approved. In that time frame, uh, coming next will probably be the Johnson & Johnson vectored vaccine, different modality. It's currently actively in phase three in a variety of countries. That will probably finish up. And again, it's unclear whether they will go through EUA or formal approval uh, at that point. And behind that would be AstraZeneca. J&J has an advantage. It's a single dose vaccine, just to get out there. Mm -hmm. AstraZeneca has had some issues and there's been some confusion about their dosing regimen, which is typically two doses. Uh, so that may be delayed. Uh, and then after that, you might have Novavax, which is a more traditional protein-based vaccine with adjuvant. And you can expect those results in the second quarter. Again, either EUA or approval. And then unfortunately, just in the news in the last couple of days, uh, Sanofi and GSK have announced that they had uh, uh, some uh, issues and uh, they're probably six months after that. So they're probably looking at late Q3, Q4. Now those latter vaccines, let me point out, the vaccines we'll talk about today in more detail were placebo controlled. So you compared basically a uh, one-to-one -one ratio between vaccinated and placebo. The next trials that are becoming after the Operation Warp Speed ones probably will be equivalent studies. We have to basically compare the new vaccine to the existing vaccine at the time. And so that'll make the race or the marathon more complicated in the second half of next year for all those second generation vaccines. Okay, great. So it sounds like we'll have four, four, three, four, five to choose from sometime next year, at least. Yeah. And uh, how confident are you that these vaccines are both safe and effective? And when will we really know about the safety? Very confident, very safe, very effective. I would get it today if I could. Mm -hmm. But I'm way back in the line, so no yeah. worries there. Yeah, Bob. The reason I say that. Yeah, uh, sorry, I Bob. Check, go ahead. I just want to check real quick if Bob would agree on the safety <laughs> and efficacy side. 
safety and effectiveness? Well, I will get it. Uh, probably not today. It's been interesting because when you see in the press reports, it says healthcare workers. Okay, we've got 12,000 of them at UCSF. Yeah. And our initial shipment is about 970 doses. So even within the bucket of healthcare workers, we have to parse it and divide it and figure it out. So I and several of my colleagues last night were pouring through rows and rows of spreadsheets with thousands of people in my department trying to figure out who's in group A, who's in group B. And that's basically determined by how much contact will you have with COVID patients. So I'm starting on clinical service a week from uh, today, uh, but the service I am on generally does not have COVID patients. So I'm gonna be in the second group. I'll probably get mine uh, a week or 10 days from now. Um, and then as people have heard, you don't really wanna vaccinate everybody in a given cohort at the same day. For example, you wouldn't wanna do the entire emergency department on one day because if the next day, you know, a decent chunk of them felt crummy and didn't want to come in, that's not good. So even within a single group at a place like UCSF that's highly competent at this and gives vaccines a lot, there's a lot of work to do to parse these groups and figure out the, the details. And that will become relevant as we talk about different groups. But in terms of myself as a 63-year-old uh, man who's going into the hospital every day, the hospital is pretty safe, but still I'm excited about getting it if I could get it this morning. I would leave this call right now and, and get it. The evidence on efficacy is astounding. It's not only 95% effective in preventing cases of COVID, but at least that effective in preventing severe cases of COVID. In the Moderna study, there were 30 patients in the group uh, of the people both vaccinated and placebo, 30 patients that had severe COVID, severe enough to go to the hospital, the ICU. When they broke the code, it turned out all 30 had received placebo. Not a single one of those severe cases happened in a vaccine. In terms of uh, what I'm worried about when I get it, I assume my arm will hurt and I'll have sort of a, a, a relatively unpleasant day, maybe some achiness, maybe a fever. I'm more likely to happen on the second dose, I'm more likely with younger people than, than older people. So on that, I'm a little safer, uh, but no evidence of any severe long-term side effects. And to me, it's not even a close call as to, uh, <clears throat> as to whether or not you get it. I think the question, the interesting question for Ken will be, you know, if the AstraZeneca efficacy or other vaccines, their efficacy is not 95%, but 70% or 80%, sort of how as a country, we kind of sort that out. Right now, it's pretty easy. There are two vaccines, they use the same technology, their safety and efficacy seems to be comparable. So it doesn't really matter, we think, which one you get, but that may change as new vaccines roll out and have slightly different numbers. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, one of the things that's become clear to many of us as we learn more about vaccinations and, and the protection is that there's a distinction between whether a vaccine protects the person being vaccinated and whether it protects other people around that, whether that person can be infectious, even if they're, they aren't uh, themselves in, uh, uh, showing symptoms. So, Ken, what do we know about that? Yeah, well, uh, Dr. Walker mentioned this. The primary endpoint in both studies was prevention of severe disease. And secondly, prevent, oh, sorry, prevention of disease period, which would be symptoms plus PCR positive, and then secondly, severe disease, and that data is stunning, as both of you have said. Um, it does not address yet whether you can be infected, whether that means you might have virus in your nose and lungs, but not show clinical symptoms, mm -hmm. uh, nor whether you might have that and then be spewing and spreading virus to others. Mm -hmm. So those two uh, endpoints are not yet known. Now, they are being looked at uh, in this study. Um, they, uh, there's a subpopulation that's being looked at that's having some sort of random swabs taken or on a routine schedule. Uh, and so over time, that data will come out. Uh, and then there are new studies that are being launched that will look at that specifically. Uh, so we'll know that. But for now, you should presume that you may get, a, you should get a vaccine. You probably will 95% protected from disease, but not necessarily from infection and spread. And therefore you should continue to wear a mask. That's the bottom line from that. And I expect mask wearing should and will continue through the next summer because of that phenomenon. Okay, okay, great. You know, we started to talk about uh, distribution, Bob, and as I think we mentioned, uh, the first people to get it are the healthcare workers who are treating other COVID patients and so forth. I think everybody in this call has at least one question in their mind, which is when, when am I eligible to get it? So can you walk us through what is the prioritization uh, uh, and, 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 and uh, if I'm not in a high priority group, when do you think I'll get vaccinated? 
Okay, so uh, it gets complicated, but the first two groups are healthcare workers and uh, and and people living in long term care facilities, things like like nursing homes. Um, the healthcare workers are starting now. UCSF, I believe, is going to start today uh, vaccinating people. Uh, nursing homes will probably be next week by the time it rolls out. Uh, those are being administered by CVS and Walgreens, uh, which act, you know, send people in a car out to a nursing home and go and vaccinate room by room. So that'll take a little while. The next group after that is there's been a recommendation by the CDC and then every state has to kind of operationalize it. But for most states, it will likely be what are known as essential workers, people in professions uh, in which they have to go out and interact with 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 a lot of folks. And that's going to be uh, probably going to be teachers, people working in 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 retail, people working in food services, uh, police uh, men and women, uh, firefighters, those kinds of groups. Then you start getting to more sort of the rest of the public and two groups that are at higher risk of bad outcomes if they get COVID. One is older people, and by that the definition is over 65. The second is people with pre-existing conditions. Uh, it gets a little dodgy trying to figure out how we're going to sort those groups out. And I say the real tricky ones are going to be essential workers and, uh, and, and uh, people with pre-existing conditions. So assume we assume that most of those vaccines will be given by places like mine, like UCSF, and by CVS and Walgreens. Are they going to be asking you to show, to prove that you're a teacher, to prove that you work in a grocery store? And how's that going to work? I don't think anybody has any idea. Are they going to be asking you to show a doctor's note that says you have a pre-existing condition? And if, if you do have to demonstrate that, what are the conditions that, that count? These are pretty tricky, and there have been a couple of reports recently that said they might just use, quote, the honor system, which if there's a vaccine shortage, it's like, really? How's that going to work? So there's a lot of tricky stuff. Now, getting to the timing question, Mark, uh, when you add up all of those groups, healthcare workers, nursing homes, people over 65, essential workers, people with pre-existing conditions, in the United States, which has 330 million people, you end up with 144 million people. So um, about a little more than a third of the population are in one of those higher priority groups. Uh, when we get through 144 million people being vaccinated with two doses of the vaccine, at least the projections are March, April. I hope that's true. That's a lot of distribution, a lot of details, a lot of FedEx, a lot of Walgreens. Uh, you know, there's just a lot of mischief that can happen. And if you look at the past year and say, how good are we at a, as a country at distributing complicated things in a political environment uh, you would say, well, how did we do on testing? Terribly. How did we do on masks? Terribly. How did we do on PPE? Terribly. So if everything goes perfect, we may be through all of those groups by March or April, in which case what will then happen is, uh, is CVS and Walgreens will put up signs on the front window and say, everybody else, go in and come in and get your vaccine the way you would come and get a flu vaccine. Yeah. Uh, so if everything goes perfectly, we're talking about opening it up for everybody probably in the late spring, but we'll have to see. But the, the key will be the uh, manufacturing schedule and deliveries. If there are no hookups there and we can truly get to a couple hundred million doses delivered through that distribution channel, it is akin to adult flu vaccination. And as long as supply uh, uh, is greater than demand, we won't have a problem. But the, the one year that we had, um, one of the flu manufacturers had a, had a factory mishap and mm -hmm. the press announced that there's a shortage of flu vaccine. Of course, the desire for flu vaccination went up dramatically. Right. right, and the product sold out that year for like for the first time, so um, that's important to know. The the second thing that will come in is is the demand. So the last study I saw, and maybe Dr. Watcher can comment on this, was the Pew Charitable Trust from September, and half of Americans said they wanted to get the vaccine, and half said they did not. Uh, and of course, African Americans were even less than half, and uh, high school educated, non college educated, less than that, and folks that identified as Republican Party, even less than that. So it was pretty shocking. So if that continues to be the case, uh, without the fears of shortages, then uh, we will work through that and supply and, and demand should meet. And we should, we should have a good program right through to the second quarter, uh, which is wonderful. I, in response to that, the more recent surveys are, are more in the 60 to 70 percent range saying that they will take it. And some of them say 50 percent and less public health officials say I should take it, which I read as Fauci 
uh, getting his shot. And so I think it's a little better and it may auto calibrate itself in an interesting way in that some people are going to want to wait for a few more months of safety, safety data and see if their friends and family took it and how they did. And that's fine because there's a shortage right now and they won't be able to get it yeah. until then. So, uh, you know, the time where it's generally available, there's going to be a lot more information, a lot more data. Uh, and yeah. uh, I, I suspect that more people will want to take it than would answer that in a survey. And certainly the surveys in September, I probably would have said I'm not sure because the process was being politicized uh, by the president. It wasn't clear that the FDA was going to stand up and do what it normally does, which is a highly rigorous evidence-based process. It's clear that that has happened. And so I'm a little less worried than I was a couple of months ago about whether people will take it. I want to talk a little more about reluctance in a moment, but before we kind of leave what's going on with the vaccines themselves, Ken, I've got another question for you that incorporates a few audience questions too. And that is, um, will you, since you're an expert, will you get the first vaccine that's available to you or would you wait for your preferred one? And if so, which do you prefer and why? How long would you wait? Would you make that trade off? And there was an audience question about to what degree will the public have a choice about which vaccine to take anyway? Yeah. Let's, let, let's, number one, I would get the vaccine as soon as I can. Um, I, like many, put my uh, parameters, uh, county of location, age, and health condition into the New York Times survey, and I'm, I think, 280th millionth in line. So it'll be a while. I'm right next but, to <laughs> But I think that for, uh, let me just skip to the third question, I'll come back. So for most of uh, the first 100 million Americans, you're really going to have a choice between just the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, the mRNA vaccines. It'll be kind of like going to your, wherever you go, your clinic, your physician, your CVS, Walgreens, and they'll either have, in, in the case of flu vaccines, either the GSK vaccine or the Sanofi vaccine. In this case, it'll be the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine. And that'll be the case through the first and second quarter. Um, after that, to your earlier point, um, if there is sufficient demand and there's not enough supply, that is a justification for an EUA for the Johnson & Johnson Janssen single-dose vector vaccine. So that could get, then become available. And so there may be a choice of a third. And then maybe AstraZeneca, maybe Novavax coming, as I said, into the third quarter. Um, and uh, amongst those, um, if you're really a vaccine aficionado, you might look at the relative neutralizing titers uh, or a measure of potency. This is different than the vaccine effectiveness, 95% number we said earlier, because we don't have that comparison yet. But what we do have from animal models and from the phase one, phase two experiments is how much antibody is generated in the recipient. And I can tell you that from that, the, oh, if you compare across all of six Operation Web Speed vaccines, the highest titers so far have come from the Novavax vaccine, two dose subunit protein with adjuvant, uh, tenfold higher than what you've seen in Moderna and Pfizer which does have some implications that that vaccine dual dose, you know, two dose regimen might give you longer duration protection, right? So right now we have this 95% figure and that's as of, you know, two months into a first to event trial. Um, over time, these trials are projected to go and be followed for up to two years to collect safety and also efficacy data um, if the blind can be maintained for mm -hmm. both the Moderna and the Pfizer uh, vaccines. Uh, and that's another area of controversy and discussion we can get into if you like. But let me stop there, Mark. Okay. Can, I, can, can I just ask a follow-up for, for you? And uh, this is what I was sort of hinting at before. Okay, April comes around. I'm waiting for my shot. And I and, um, and AstraZeneca has gotten approved, but the studies show it's 70% effective, which, which the FDA said a bar of 50%. So it will, if it's safe, it should get approved. Now, am I going to go around and comparison shop to try to be sure I get the Pfizer and Moderna at 95% or is 70% good enough that if I have access to it, that I, I should take that? I would get whichever vaccine I can get as soon as possible. Again, these vaccine efficacy numbers are probabilistic, right? Even when half the country is vaccinated, even when we get to herd immunity, which is a population issue, not an individual issue, you still run the risk of getting infected getting very sick and dying, period. So get the first vaccine you can get and don't comparison shop. <laughs> okay. Great, we've got uh, a number of questions. Um, I, th I think we addressed a bit, but I just wanna make sure people are clear on them. There was a question of are, if you're vaccinated, might you, uh, might you infect others? And the answer is we don't know right now, if I'm correct. And when will we know that, Ken, it sounded like that'll take some number of months before we really understand 
the answer to that question. Yes, I, I think that some of that data I would I would guess would come out by the time the formal BLA is put in for approval in April timeframe from Pfizer, and soon thereafter, about the same time, maybe a month later from Moderna. There was a little preliminary data in the Moderna pack uh, in terms of so they are doing some of the nasal swabs, and it did. It, it was mildly hopeful in terms of a lower uh, a lower viral dose uh, in terms of carriage. So carriage, yeah, 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 which doesn't say for sure that you are not infectious, but uh, we may start getting this in drips and drabs, little pieces of information that either do or don't indicate whether you can carry uh, and spread the virus. And at least the very very preliminary stuff right now is uh, it tips a little bit toward the hopeful. Yeah, yeah, I think so many of us are concerned about that because uh, let's say I get vaccinated early for whatever reason. When I come home, am I, am I no longer a threat to the rest of my family or, or am I as much as ever? And if I've been vaccinated, I'd be that much more likely to go out and do stuff I wouldn't have done before I was vaccinated. <laughs> but yeah. that puts me at more at risk. So that's why we're eager. We're, at, yeah. we're having, we'll have those marital issues in my household because I will go next week and my wife probably won't go for four months. And I will continue to wear a mask until I'm absolutely sure that I cannot be carrying it. Great. Well, that's marital wisdom right there. Yeah. Well, as you know, my wife's a hospital-based <laughs> physician, so I guess I'll have to break that news to her as well. <laughs> hey, what about if someone's already been infected? Are, are they going to be put at the back of the line, or should they not get a COVID vaccine if they've already been infected? Well, we to tackle that. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, let me start. Uh, uh, then Dr. Walter can comment. So in the trials that were done by Moderna and Pfizer, uh, in fact, uh, there were some people that had been infected that continue to get vaccinated. So they basically were tested at baseline and got the results after they'd already had their first dose. Yeah. Uh, and so the good news is that uh, there were no adverse events for that subpopulation. There was no enhanced disease, which was a concern early on theoretically uh, by some parties. And so that's really good news. So yeah, even if you think you've had it or you're not sure, whatever, just get vaccinated, you should. Okay. I did, I did. Walker, what would you add? Well, it's an interesting question because at a in a perfect world, in 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 a setting now that we have a vaccine shortage, you might very well say, if I knew that I had COVID in April and I knew I had antibodies, and we know that from having seen you know tens of millions of people with COVID, the number of cases of reinfection you can count on the fingers of two hands or or four hands, I guess. Uh, that maybe I should go to the back of the line or at least wait a few months until everybody else who doesn't have antibodies gets their vaccine. I should get it later because I don't know. It, it, it's, it's quite likely that the effectiveness of the vaccines is greater than my own natural immunity. And my natural immunity may start waning because I got infected six months ago. So certainly the fact that you had an infection before does not mean you should not get a vaccine and the, the recommended strategy is just go ahead and get it. So in a perfect world, you might parse it that way and say, well, you've had COVID before, you have antibodies, you should wait. The problem is that adds like 10 more logistical degrees of difficulty to already an incredibly complicated yeah. thing. So yeah. The best and theoretic the yeah. health level is just go ahead and everybody gets it when, it, when their number's up. Yeah, and theoretically, if you are at high risk because you've got cold more, you know, other factors, then you're earlier in the line and you should get vaccinated anyways just for that extra protection. But it's an interesting point. Uh, the vaccines are striving. And one of the measures I mentioned earlier was that antibody titer. And as I mentioned, the Novavax has tenfold greater uh, titers than the Johnson & Johnson, Janssen, or Moderna uh, and Pfizer vaccines. That, that does bode well that, that, that maybe the vaccines give you better protection than natural immunity. That's a very critical point. Oh, and that, that, that would be ideal as an outcome. Oh, very interesting. You know, we have a question from the audience that, that, that uh, bears on something that I was thinking about asking about, too. It's curious. There's a lot of concern that the wealthy and powerful will jump to the front of the line. And Bob, as you point out, it's going to be a hard line to figure out, you know, who's supposed to be there anyway or to prove anything. Um, and that, of course, would be to the disadvantage of disadvantaged people and people of color. So if we can prevent that problem and uh, get fair and equitable distribution for people of color, we've got a different problem, which is that people of color for understandable reasons, are distrustful of the medical system and may be less likely to take a vaccine when offered. So I guess the question, Bob, I'll throw this to you, is how can the country's leader persuade people of color to uh, take the vaccine when offered if it's going to be helpful to them? Yeah, it's a huge challenge. I mean, people of color are skeptical of vaccines, and uh, some of this comes honestly in terms of some of the experiments that have been done in the past that are uh, that are truly heinous. Um, 
you know, we have, I think masks have demonstrated that we have not been very effective at preventing disinformation about getting the evidence out there to all sorts of communities so that people can make a rational choice about uh, about what to do. And in doing that, uh, it clearly is going to require a multi-pronged approach. It, it's, it's terrific that Biden says it works. It's terrific that Fauci says it works and that it's safe for Given communities, it's going to be important to figure out who are the influencers in those communities who will convince people that it is safe and effective. And whether it's what those influencers say or those influencers actually getting the vaccine and demonstrating. And in some communities that will be clergy, in some communities that will be uh, uh, political leaders uh, on the ground. Uh, in some communities, it's going to be people that they follow on Instagram or on uh, TikTok. Uh, you know, we've got to be really clever and thoughtful about this. And because at the end of the day, if whatever the communities are, you know, if you sync up the highest risk people to get sick and die from this, and that is the group that is reluctant to get the vaccine, then we're never going to get out of this, uh, this yeah. predicament we're going to see. Yeah. 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 So this, this whole topic of vaccination is critical and is really going to come upon the shoulders of the incoming head of CDC, Rasha Walensky, and the incoming Surgeon General. Vivek Murthy. Uh, that's who's going to have to pick those um, leading role models or figures to drive adoption or uptake of vaccination in those different siloed subpopulations we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Can there are a couple of questions from the audience really about reactions. So Bob alluded to this, but you can say more about, you know, when you get vaccinated, what you expect in terms of how you feel, number one. There were some news about reports in Britain about some bad reactions to vaccinations. And someone asked specifically, you know, is Moderna's uh, vaccine better for those who have bad reactions to vaccines? So as um, Dr. Walker mentioned, you can expect with these vaccines to get soreness in the arm and, protect, protect, you know, and uh, high frequency headache and fatigue, for sure. Those stand out. Um, so you should expect that. Uh, and a little bit less with the second dose and less with age, as Dr. Walker mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, there are two phenomena that were being watched. So one is the press report from the British about the Pfizer vaccine with a super allergic reaction. Um, and so if you're a person that's known to, to have that in their past, um, one should be aware of it and, and tell the vaccinator uh, when this is happening. But you're typically held for 15 minutes, in some cases, 30 minutes to look at your reaction post the injection, right? And that should take forth. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that's a major worry, and there's, there's not a warning of that uh, in the United States for either vaccine yet. The second one that came out, and it's really come out this morning with regard to the Moderna vaccine, is Bell's palsy, uh, which is a partial um, paralysis of one side of the face, uh, which is short-lived. Uh, and that's something that I think that, uh, the, that will be looked at and will be tracked as we go from vaccinating a total of, uh, let's see, 22, 35, 37,000 people have received vaccine from active vaccine, not placebo, from Moderna and Pfizer, that's all. But we're heading towards 2.9 million this month alone, right? Plus on top of that, another, you know, just increase that by 20 million by the time you get to the end of January. So you'd be looking to continue to track safety issues. Most safety or reactogenic issues happen very quickly in, in that time period. And then certainly very sh shortly thereafter, that's why the FDA was fine with emergency use authorization after only two months of safety data. But there is the VAERS, um, Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, B-A-E-R-S, which will, is used in this country routinely to track uh, recipients of vaccinations to see what bad things might happen. And it's a very sophisticated tracking system for that. Maybe Dr. Wachter wants to comment on that as well. Well, I, I, first of all, in terms of the, uh, the side effects, um, I interviewed Paul Ofa, who's one of the world's vaccine experts a couple of weeks ago, and he said that the... the um, uh, the vaccines need a better PR team because those side effects are your body's way of saying it's working. That's, <laughs> your, <laughs> that's your immune system doing its thing. Yeah. And, you know, in some ways you, you should welcome that you feel some a little, you know, some achiness because that is your body's immune system revving up. It shows that the vaccines are taking. The two cases in the UK were concerning. They, you know, there were significant allergic reactions. Both patients did fine with treatment. And the UK immediately said, we will not vac vaccinate people with a history of severe allergic reactions. 
I think that was that's the wrong call because again, we haven't had anyone who's had a serious long-term bad outcome from an allergic reaction. And if you say everybody in the country who's had a bad allergic reaction to anything shouldn't get a vaccination, you're taking tens of millions of people out of the line. And that clearly will cause more harm and more death than than the allergy. So I'm with Ken. If you know, if I'd had a history of allergic reactions and I carry an EpiPen, I would let the person giving me the shot know that. I would hang around that uh, that space where they have you know materials, uh, drugs to give me if I have an allergic reaction for maybe a half hour, forty five minutes to be on the safe side. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but that's it. The yeah. worry, you know, as Ken said. Now we're going to get into, you know, following tens of millions of people for uh, for side effects and for uh, for potential long term problems. We didn't see them in the first 40,000 people. Here's my biggest worry, uh, Mark, which is that if you vaccinate 20 million people, there will be uh, thousands of people that have heart attacks, have strokes, have uh, a new diagnosis of dementia, uh, new diagnosis of autism. In the next couple of months, that's called coincidence. That is, those are the numbers that you would expect in a population of 20 million people followed for several months. And in a world of, of social media and disinformation and Russian bots, I worry about every one of those cases getting amplified it into, you see, this is, you know, these drugs are dangerous. So we're going to have to be really thoughtful, get the message out, not to blow off the possibility that there will be some rare side effect that, that emerges late. Uh, I think it's unlikely, but not impossible. Uh, but A, it will be rare because we haven't seen any evidence of it yet. The risk benefit of the vaccine will still be quite positive. And B, to sort of separate out all these co- coincidental bad things that just happen to people naturally from uh, from the possibility that it's, it's yeah. from the vaccine. Sure, sure. Yeah. So just, let me just add and amplify into that. So I was on a policy call le- last week and the question came up, well, w- 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 uh, let's assume that there is a true side effect that's one out of a million, and it will not show up and not be reported until late January, early February. Um, based on the 35,000 or so that have had vaccines so far, you look at what's the odds of being infected with SARS-CoV-2 and getting COVID-19 versus having the side effect, it's a thousand to one in favor, you should get the vaccine. Because mm-hmm. you're much more likely to get COVID than you are to get a side effect from, from the vaccine, which to, right now is purely theoretical. So okay. vastly in your favor, get the vaccine. So I get that both of you are really in favor of everyone getting the vaccine, except, of course, not everyone. There are some number of people, some categories of people who shouldn't get it. Previous conditions, I've heard pregnant women. Ken, what's the story on who shouldn't get the vaccine? Uh, Severe immunocompromised that cannot mount their own immune reaction or their system doesn't work, as Dr. Wachter was describing a moment ago, uh, should not get the vaccine. That's a very small population. Again, in nuances, in the the two trials that are being reported from Pfizer Moderna, there were women that entered that had the vaccine that then got pregnant. And so they'll be tracked obviously for the next several months to see. There's not expected to be any problems there. There were people that were less than age 18. So you know the EUA for the Pfizer vaccine includes uh, 16 and 17 year olds. And now studies are being done by Moderna down to age 12 and even six to 12 year old studies will be started next spring. Uh, So the available population will get much, much larger over the next six months. So specifically, if I'm a pregnant woman, which I'm obviously not, uh, should I get the vaccine? Is that an option? What's, what are the thoughts about that? I'm not a doctor. I don't give medical advice, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I see no reason not to get the vaccine, but I'm mm. going to pass that one to Dr. Wachter. Uh, you know, it, it was not tested in people who were known to be pregnant. Uh, at least the vaccinologists that I've spoken to about this believe that it's highly likely to be safe. And uh, and that the risk of getting COVID and getting sick from it is higher than the risk of the vaccine. The way the FDA left the EUA is to leave that open as an option. They did not say that pregnant women or lactating women should not get it. They said that should be a conversation between uh, they and their physicians. And I, I, I think that's that's reasonable based on what we know. And if I were in that situation, I would still take the vaccine when my chance came. Yeah, let me let me add these vaccines are mRNA vaccines, so they're, in that sense, inert. There are other types of vaccines that are live attenuated, and that would be a different story. Mm-hmm. But let's not get into that sidebar. So when okay. the va- next vaccine, we're talking about the second generation COVID vaccines come, that may be more of an issue, it may need to be studied, but that's different. As you said, uh, anybody over 18, this all applies to 16, 17, arguably, and then beyond that, those people, unless they have a pre-existing condition, people 15 or under, probably are not going to be at the front of the line. And we hope we'll have more data by the, uh, in the spring, perhaps. Is that the way to think about your younger people? 
Yeah, studies will be, will be conducted from 12 to 18 year olds and from six to 12 year olds that are coming. But no good reason to believe that they will have problems with the vaccine. It's just the way vaccine trials are done. They're not done on young people to begin with. And, you know, people talk about this because the schools are so important. But if we can get to a situation where all of the teachers and the custodians and the adults in a school are vaccinated and the vaccination rates in a community are high enough that the that the that the virus just isn't very prevalent in the community. What's very clear now is that young kids are safer in terms of uh, the risk of a bad outcome or e and even the risk of spreading the virus than adults are. So I think we can get to a situation where the schools become very safe even before we have vaccinated the kids. Okay, so over the next number of months, let's say six months or so, our, the population will be in the process of getting vaccinated as a population. So let's say at some point in the middle of that, I get vaccinated or anybody gets vaccinated. What can and can't that person do? Uh, can they travel? Can grandparents play with their grandkids? Uh, wh wh what do we see, Ken, in terms of the future there? I think that uh, you can, as I said earlier, I think you'll continue to wear a mask until data comes out to show that you are not um, carrying virus, you're not s spreading virus. And so I don't think the, that data will come out until the second quarter. Mm -hmm. So I think we continue to use the public health measures that we're using today right through into the second quarter until that data comes out. Then you might know that, for example, as Dr. Walker said, if I have very, very little carriage, so I'm not likely to spread, then you can take that mask off, you can play with the grandkids, you can travel, you can spend intimate family time. Um, you know, large events may may ensue, but we'll we'll get to that in due course. I think that's more more the summertime, late fall next year. But in terms of the question of what you can yeah. should and would think about doing, I'll give you a personal example, uh, Mark. That that um, I have not uh, seen uh, gone to my uh, hair <laughs> to my uh, barber for the last year. My wife has uh, done it quite well, honey. If you're watching. <laughs> uh, I've not seen my dentist for the past year, and I and I should. Once I get vaccinated, a couple of weeks after that, I will be comfortable doing those things in a way that I've just said it's not worth taking the risk, you know, because if I get it, I could get very sick, go to the hospital and die. It just seems like a silly thing to do uh, for a haircut. Uh, but I think your sort of personal risk-benefit equation will change your willingness to travel uh, so, you know, getting an airplane is a le relatively low risk thing now if everybody is masked. But once I'm vaccinated, I, I'll, I'll be much less concerned about things that right now might be on the edge of am I willing to take right. the risk. Right. right. Yeah. And, and to be not to be too technical, but I think 10 days after his second dose is when Dr. Walker will go back to the barber and the dentist mm -hmm. and so forth. You got to go a little. A full benefit from the vaccination process. I mean, whatever, <laughs> your, your immunity begins to kick in. Those curves diverge about yeah. days to two weeks after the first dose, yeah. but it did not reach its full effect until the second dose. So, uh, yeah, there's some complex decisions about uh, my, my hair versus uh, that timing. Yeah, and your hair looks marvelous. Tell your Thank wife you that. So, much. I so, that. <laughs> so that's what the individual can do. Let's think about the population. Uh, you know, Ken. You know, they, we talk. People talk about whether it's seventy or eighty percent of the population that gets inoculated before we have some kind of herd immunity, and the virus is pretty much uh, tamed. Um, but do you think we'll ever return to pre-pandemic levels of activity? And if so, when and what needs to happen? Yeah. So a couple of thoughts. So first is. Herd immunity I mentioned earlier is a population term. So that means you basically flatten the curve. But that does not mean there's still uh, not disease in society. So disease will still be spreading. People will still be vulnerable if they're not vaccinated. They can still get sick and die, even when you reach that herd immunity threshold. So mm -hmm. keep, that in, keep that in mind. Um, I think it's a fascinating question, what happens to our society uh, post-COVID, right? I think a lot will depend on that ratio of supply and demand and uh, the depoliticization of vaccines and vaccination and the respect, return respect to the institutions such as the FDA and the CDC and so forth in terms of how this will all manifest itself into 2022. I think the United States theoretically will get through all of this in, in, into that year, uh, but I think the rest of the globe will be lacking because we're very focused on you know, getting vaccines to Americans, but you have to remember there's 7.8 billion people and it's gonna take another two or three or four years for the vaccines to get out there to, to stop the spread or have them reach herd immunity, if you want to, want to put it that way. Uh, so you might think of returning to travel and so forth in, in the United States, uh, but you still may be very hesitant to travel internationally into far off places until, until that happens. And that may be a two or three, four year process going forward. 
Yeah, my, my view is I've, I've used a simplifying assumption all along, and, the, and, and, and it may not turn out to be right, but here it is. It, it is that uh, we in the United States have tolerated uh, the flu forever. And the flu kills about 40,000 people a year. So it's not a nothing. You can get the flu, you can get sick, and you can die of it. 40,000 people a year on average do. And we have tolerated that. And by that tolerated, I mean that some of us get a vaccine, some of us don't. We don't clean our hands compulsively. We don't wear masks. We don't avoid large crowds. We go to football games, all that kind of stuff with 40,000 people a year dying of the flu. So that's been my simplifying assumption that if we reach a stage where the risk of COVID is akin to the risk of the flu, and again, we, that's even has become political. People were talking about it's like the flu. <laughs> six months ago, it was not like the flu. Much, 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 much worse. But, you know, six times worse. So when we reach a stage where the amount of infection is such and our treatments for COVID, which have gotten better, we haven't talked about, but have gotten better. The mortality rate is lower than it was a few months ago, uh, six months ago. We reach a stage where it is like the flu. People still get COVID. Some people die of it, but it's like the flu. My assumption has been we will go back to normal because we've demonstrated that we tolerate flu and we live our normal lives. So it could be that we don't reach full on herd immunity, meaning the virus is essentially dying out. It can't find enough uh, uh, noses and mouths to, 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 uh, to cause infection. We don't quite get to that level, but we get to a level where a lot of people are vaccinated. The virus level is very low. The treatments are very good so that even if you get it, there's a relatively small chance you're going to die of it. I think we will, and, I, and that's going to be, you know, at minimum six months from now. So we'll be a year and a half into this thing and people are going to be tired of masks, tired of not seeing their, their, their grandparents, tired of not going to the theater. I think we will probably say, declare victory and say, let's go back to normal, whether yeah. it's the right moment or we should have waited a month from then or who knows. But I, that is my metric. It's not going to be zero cases or zero deaths. It's going to be when we actually have reached like the flu stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it could be that, uh, the reason I said fascinated earlier, is that it could be that there is a, an effect on society such that people do continue to wear masks. Um, I'll give you the anecdote in my, in my personal story, which is that usually my wife complains, I'm, I, you know, I'm traveling all over the country and all over the world. I'm constantly getting sick. I've had my healthiest year, probably <laughs> because I'm wearing a mask. I'm doing so, you know, physical distancing. I'm washing my hands with swabs all the time. And I've had, a, you know, physically, uh, health-wise, a great year. And uh, maybe others will recognize that as well. And maybe that'll continue. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting we'll end up like some of the Asian societies where mask wearing is very routine, very accepted, very encouraged. Uh, but but it, but it, an optimist in me says that it might go in that direction. Possibly, uh, and it is important to say that the flu we were worried about this twin pandemic. Yeah, I, the, flu, the flu has been nothing this year. And, exactly. And, yeah. and, and says the most benign flu year in recent history. Probably for those reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> There are a few little tactical questions I wanted to get from the audience. Uh, one, I know the answer to. How far apart are the doses given? I know that's either three or four weeks based on the two different uh, groups uh, uh, vaccines. Um, question about how will people be notified uh, when it's time to get vaccinated? And one particular question specific was, when do veterans get vaccines? Do they have any difference in the, in the line of priorities? And Bob, I'll throw that to you. Uh, how you'll be notified, I think, is going to be uh, it's probably going to be through the way <laughs> through your news channels rather than you specifically getting a notice. I think you're going to see Walgreens advertising that it's time for you know regular people to get their vaccine or advertising that now people over 65 uh, are ready. Uh, you'll hear it from the CDC. It, it, it will be unmistakable within institutions. I'm waiting through, you know, I'm checking my phone from UCSF to see when my number comes up. So within institutions, uh, we are notifying individuals uh, by email that you're, you know, it's time for you to make your appointment over this three day window next week. I've not yet get, gotten mine, but uh, I may get it later today. In terms of veterans, I don't think there's any special dispensation for veterans. The VA will be a distribution site at the VA. The UCSF faculty who we have at the VA will get their, their, their vaccines at the VA. People in VA nursing homes will get their vaccines as part of the nursing home push right now. But for, uh, for veterans, uh, I think their category will be determined by their category otherwise. Are, are they over 65? Do they have pre-existing conditions? I don't think there's any special push for veterans as a category. Yeah, Thanks. agreed. Thanks. Ken, there's a quick question about uh, should we be concerned about the virus mutating and, and thus making the vaccines less effective? 
Uh, short answer is thus far, no, you should not be concerned, but the virus definitely has mutated. Um, there are now, last time I looked, there were over 36,000 different genomes of various uh, SARS-CoV-2 viruses uh, in the database, and you can find changes throughout its genome. Uh, people have talked a lot about uh, changes in the spike protein, uh, because that is where the, all the six Operation Warp Speed vaccines are focused uh, on protecting using the spike protein as the antigen. Uh, and that is a very famous one called D614G, uh, which basically went from nothing to the dominant strain, if you will, around the world. Uh, but it has had no effect uh, thus far on, on, on vaccination. And, and so um, this virus is new to man. So you think about this zoonosis that went from animal to man. And it's like a forest fire. It's all virgin dry wood. It's just burning through. And so you've got more replicative cycles or generations of virus than, than are really conceivable. It must be in billions and trillions. I don't know the, the exact math there. Um, and so there will be continued mutations. Um, if you mutate the spike protein so much so that it doesn't bind its receptor, which has been identified as something called ACE2, then theoretically it doesn't become infectious anymore. So at some point the mutation becomes self-defeating. But it is being very, uh, very well tracked by many, many different laboratories uh, on all continents. Um, and we'll certainly know about it before it becomes a problem. Bob, Bob, I have a question for you, going back to sort of the distribution piece, and that is we're so worried about everybody getting the vaccine when it's available. What about the people who don't want to get the vaccine, particularly on the healthcare side? Do you believe that everybody at, at UCSF, all the healthcare workers will get the vaccine? And for those who refuse, is, is that a problem? What do you do about that? We, it's a good question. Uh, I, I, right now we are not, the University of California system has decided not to require it, <clears throat> but to strongly encourage it. And I expect that most of my colleagues will get it, although not all. I think that there will come a time over the next few months where with a little bit more experience under our belt, organizations like healthcare uh, organizations will require that their people uh, get it. And many of them do require that people get the flu vaccine that has been supported by, uh, by the courts. The, the broader question in society, I think will we'll, uh, end up boiling down to this issue of immunity passports where it may, it probably will not be that the government of the state or of the country will require that everybody gets a vaccine, but it may very well be that for you, if you want to fly, you may need to demonstrate that you've been vaccinated. Uh, for you to go into a sports stadium, you may be able to demonstrate, have to demonstrate that you've been vaccinated. Uh, that's a way, that's a ways off. And I think it would be inappropriate until everybody's had access to the vaccine. But once people have had access to it and it's available freely, Perfectly reasonably, you know, somebody may make a choice not to get it, but the, then they probably, it, it's not unreasonable to consider the possibility that they will uh, not be allowed into certain things that other people with immunity are allowed into. That's obviously complicated legally, it's complicated ethically. Um, we're not there yet, but I can see us moving in that direction as we get to the end game. Oh, it's tricky. Ken, one more question about the vaccines overall. Let's say you take a vaccine, it's 70% effective. Can you take a second one that's 95? Should you take more than one vaccine? Oh, we're, we're away from that uh, optionality. Uh, <laughs> at least a year away from that optionality. But the, the short answer is yes, you can. So an example would be uh, years ago, um, uh, Merck came out with a very effective vaccine for shingles, uh, Zostravax which was about, if I recall, 50, 60% uh, effective. Uh, more recently, GSK came out with a two-dose vaccine, Shingrix, which is more like 95% effective. And of course, I had the Merck vaccine, and I followed up by getting the two-dose GSK vaccine. So there's nothing wrong with that. I just wanted to take all precaution to protect myself against shingles. And so I think an analogy could be the case here as we get to second-generation uh, COVID vaccines. And as the safety is flushed out over, because it'll be in tens and tens of millions of uh, people, and the efficacy is very well studied, and the carriage and the spreading is, is, is known. You know, in 2022, yes, you could, you could think about uh, having repeat and other vaccines. And a critical question, and we touched on it at the very beginning, is what's the duration of protection? We don't know that. I think uh, Dr. Walker and I both agree that, that it could be the vaccines give you better protection than natural immunity uh, from infection, uh, and maybe that's a year or two or three. Uh, and it will have to be determined. It's just not known right now. Great, thanks. We're just about out of time, so I have one last question I'll ask to both of you. Uh, uh, and that is really that in just over six months, we'll be celebrating the 4th of July holiday. So what do you expect it will be safe to do during those celebrations compared to what we did in 2019? 
I suspect by the 4th of July that everybody who's wanted to get the vaccine will have had the opportunity to get it. And I think, I don't think it's going to be uh, that we're going to be wearing masks to all events. And that, that may be sort of the last thing to go that uh, congregating in, you know, in a, in a big stadium may be something that we still avoid. But, you know, it, this is the tension here, Mark, is of sort of the individual versus the sort of public health situation. As an individual, if I and the people around me have gotten the vaccine, I think we will be comfortable congregating in a way that we just weren't um, uh, six months ago. Whether the society has said, all right, it's all good, you can do whatever you want, I'm guessing we won't quite be there. And there may be still some prescription on having, you know, going to a place with a thousand people. Mm -hmm. Ken, what do you think? Again, the optimist in me would say that uh, I would expect that we would be in the um, the mop-up phase. Uh, so I imagine I'd be going to Fenway Park and seeing the Boston Red Sox uh, defeat the Yankees. And uh, there would be a, a vaccination campaign in, uh, in mobile uh, clinics outside so that uh, fans like me could have the privilege of going to a group gathering in Fenway Park to see the game. Mm -hmm. um, as, as Dr. Walker was saying, there's a penalty by not being able to do things. I would sort of frame it as there'll be privileges and, you know, for those that have gotten vaccinated, they can do the large group gatherings. And you can imagine by this analogy, other, other settings where that might be the case come next summer. Even so indoors. Even indoors. Yeah. So perhaps the next time we meet, we'll be at the beautiful Commonwealth Club building at 110 The Embarcadero. That's great. Well, I want to give a big thank you to Dr. Bob Wachter and Ken Kelly for joining us virtually today for the Commonwealth Club program. If you enjoyed this program, I encourage you to make a donation to support this and other club programs. I'm Mark Sitter of the Zedema Project, and now this virtual meeting of the Commonwealth Club is adjourned. Please stay healthy and happy holidays.